Hey guys, thanks for stopping back to Pete's Garage. Well, I'm going to continue on with my engine building series here, uh, but I wanted to stop for just a moment. After I did the intake manifold uh, theory video and installing the intake manifold, I began a lot of questions about powder coating. Now I have I have a powder coating video already, but it's it's uh, it doesn't show the complete process and it doesn't have a great explanation behind the powder. So what I'd like to do is uh, I just got this into my shop uh, today. This is a uh, Torker, Edelbrock Torker 455 manifold for a big block Chevy. And I'm going to be powder coating this. And what I'd like to do is show you uh, the powder coating process, the how to protect holes, how to mask things off, protect threads, protect the intake surfaces from getting powder on it, and how to go through that process. Uh, and I'd like to show you, or share with you, the different types of powders that are available for different types of applications. So depending on what you're going to be coating, you know what kind of powder to choose because there are many different powders. And knowing me, like you probably do, there's going to be some theory behind it. I'll show you how the electrostatic process works, why it works, and uh, once you know how and why it works, it'll help you problem solve better. So we'll go through that first. Okay, when we start talking about resins and chemical compositions of powders for powder coating, First, we talk about polyester, polyester powder coating. Uh, polyester, resin, polyester resins, those are for most part, the, these are the workhorses of the U.S. market because more than 60% of the market uses these polyester-based coatings. They hold up very well uh, to the standard outdoor exposure, for standard outdoor exposure. Um, if you give, they give you a, a broader application field so you have a broad application field for many different applications, but don't confuse that with really harsh conditions. You're not going to put this on something that's going to be on the, your beachfront property and expect your birdhouse to withstand sand, salt, and wind to beat it up. So while this is a, mostly used, it's, it's not the best or strongest for a particular applications. So that's the one. These are ones we mostly are going to use. Now the next one is another polyester coating or another polyester powder and it's referred to as polyester TGIC. The TGIC stands for triglycidyl isocyanurate. Okay, that's the chemistry. If we look at the chemistry, the primary choice is still polyester TGIC, although these the TGIC powders are, are starting to gain ground with those, but the polyester TGIC powder is uh, still a very good choice because it's a very robust powder and it has a huge uh, application possibilities. It's, it's, it's just the primary choice. It's huge. But remember, this is why you wear a, a respirator when you spray powders and you put powders on your material. Anything that has an isocyanurate or triglycidyl kind of chemical in it, you really don't want that in your lungs. It goes with everything. You can always protect your lungs, make sure you're wearing a respirator, but this is why. That's what's in these powders that can hurt you. Now, the TGIC free powders, these are used mostly in Europe and the reason that they go through this is that they have some uh, distinct advantages and disadvantages over the last 15 years of becoming more and more popular. The advantages of these include these, they have a, um, the, there's a longer storage time, so they can be stored for longer periods of time. So if you don't use them quickly, uh, you can keep the powders a lot longer. There's a high pass efficiency, meaning when you put them on, the first pass is going to get a, a very good coating or very even coating uh, of the part. Uh, it's going to provide a very, very smooth surface. The surface will be very, very smooth and it requires a, a lower temperature to cure. So it's kind of like, works kind of like painting where uh, you have um, a, a paint. The slower the cure, same thing with epoxy, slower the cure, the glossier the finish, the smoother it's going to be. So that's why uh, those are used mostly in Europe and because Europe is more concerned about the VOCs. So they'll use something that's free. You won't have this uh, TGIC for I, the, the free powder. They want to, they're concerned about the environment a little bit more there because it's a little smaller. However, they do have a thickness limit. These, uh, the, th the, the thickness limitations are because there's a small percentage, there's a low water con concentration inside these, which is why you need a lower temperature. So with the lower water um, concentration in there, it's going to be, the small water that needs to be evaporated during a cure limits how thick you can put it on. If you put it on thick with low water, it's going to crack, so you've got to put it on thin. So, but however, you can put on many coats. So 
This is more preferable when they have to use a heavy film buildup. So a heavy film buildup, you want to use a TGIC uh, powder, lower temperature, more coverage. Uh, the last one we have, it's still a polyester, this polyester isocyanate. It's a polyurethane. So again, we're talking about this is isocyanurate, this is isocyanate. Uh, different chemistry, still very, very dangerous. Uh, the polyurethane coatings, so it's a polyester, a polyurethane coating. The polyurethanes are best known, these are used for exterior applications. One of the major benefits of these is that, uh, is that the formulations allow, it's a more stable gloss. Um, the, the, the gloss is very stable. It's a low gloss. It's for like mats, uh, flat coatings, that thing, for exterior use. So now you're talking about uh, you know, parts that you're going to have in your house, like uh, around your house, maybe uh, lamp posts, fixtures, those kind of things. So it's going to work better in those kind of applications. Uh, polyurethanes also show, they also show better chemical resistance. So they're going to have a better chemical resistance than your standard polyester TGIC products. So, you know, you have an anti-graffiti application or something like that, you're going to use, you can use something with isocyanate because it has a better uh, stability with the flat. Uh, slower cure, it has a slower cure time. And that slower cure is part of the chemistry because of the blocking agent. There's an isocyanate hardener in there, the iso hardener in there. Uh, the chemistry, the, it, the way that cure time works, the blocking of the, the, uh, the D block, I'm sorry, D blocking of the isocyanate hardener allows us to cure slower so you get lower VOCs. When you get lower VOCs, you can have uh, evaporation is lower, the blocking agent, it just it allows the VOCs to be lower. So it's a polyurethane, and while you get better, uh, better a chemical resistance and a slower cure time you get uh, the benefits are the lower VOCs, evaporation and blocking agent if that kind of makes sense so now the last polyester resin is called a super durable polyester resin now these have grown immensely huge growth in the last five to ten years in the US coating market and they now, they, they now command uh, most of the coastal areas and the southern US markets for one main reason they have uh, elevated gloss retentions. The gloss retention is huge for super durable polyesters. In real harsh conditions, uh, these materials can outperform a standard polyester resin system in terms of in terms of color. Let me grab my marker. Excuse my reach. Uh, in terms of color and gloss retention, these super durable polyesters are going to outperform any one of these polyester resins. Okay. So these are the polyester resins that you're most likely going to use. Uh, now let me talk about some of the different types of resins that are available. Now we have the different type of resin uh, powders that are used for different applications. We have a, a fluoropolymer powder. This is considered to be the best of the best of the Cadillac of all the powder coating powders. It's great to be used outdoors. It has a high chemical resistance. It has a high, a very long life, so you can expect it to last a long time. The weatherability is great, and the UV stability is there, and it's fantastic. Uh, this is a, a, another choice, more expensive, different what you're going to use it for, but this is the best of the best if you can get a fluoropolymer powder. powder. The next one is epoxy. Uh, epoxy is a little different. It's not like you think like epoxy paint where it's going to be her, the, the best, harder, etc. It's going to be last longer. It has a lower UV uh, protection and it's going to tend to chalk. Um, the, the positive, if you're going to use an epoxy type, uh, powder, it has a very high chemical resistance and high resistance to salt, so salt spray. So if you're going to have a part that's outside, a, a, a epoxy uh, powder would be great. It can also be used as a base. You can put it on underneath. If you're going to put it underneath a poly, a regular polyurethane or a polymer type um, pot, uh, powder, and, and it will provide a, a base for that poly to sit on and it, make, it remains more flexible. So if you're going to put a base down, like a primer coat, you can put epoxy powder down, keep it flexible, and put the other powder right on top of it. Then we have hybrid powders. Hybrid powders are mixed between epoxy and a poly mix. Uh, epoxy and poly, they mix together. And these are the kinds you're going to find on outdoor furniture. They're, they're a hybrid between both, more commonly used for fur furnitures. Now, the one you're probably most used to seeing are acrylic. Acrylic powders, these are used in the auto industry for clears. So if you buy a part and it's clear powder coated, most likely it's going to be used with an acrylic powder because 
It is very smooth, it is very clear, and it is very chip resistant. And it's very chip resistant because it has this ingredient there, a GMA, a ingredient there, it's a glycidyl methocyanate, or uh, methoacrylate, I'm sorry. And this is what makes this one more attractive to the auto industry. Since it's an acrylic, it's not a polymer, it doesn't have the chemicals in it, but it does have a glycine in it and a, a methoacrylate, not as potent as the other chemicals, which makes it a little more attractive. The, uh, the last one is a uh, silicone. The silicones are the, not silicon, silicone for all the English wordsmiths out there, is used for high heat applications. Now, th there are different temperature ranges for different types of silicone powders, and they usually ra average in range from 400 to 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. You can use those, uh, uh, they'll have different additives in it if you want to go from 400 to 600, 600 to 800, 900, 1,000 degrees. There's different uh, additives and different percentages of silicone in there that will change the heat range of the uh, powder. However, if you're going to co uh, coat something like a header, something that's going to see high heat and exhaust manifold, you can use 100% silicone powder for powder coating that can get you up to 1100 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay? Those are the basic powders that are available. When you buy a powder, it should indicate what type of powder it is. So you have a good idea of what it's going to do, how it's going to perform, and if you should buy something else. That's the basics of powders. Now let me draw a quick picture of how the powder coating process works, what it looks like in the air, uh, and how the particles are concentrated and how they attract to the part one. And then I'm going to do, like everybody, or not everybody, maybe some of you love, the math and the science behind electrostatic processes. Why does electrostatic process work and how does it work? Let me do that right now. So this is how your powder coating gun works. And guns are different, they're different configuration. But what you basically have here is you have your powder coating gun. And you, you either have low voltage or high voltage coming in to the gun, which is where the static is applied or where the, the, powder, uh, the powder gets its a static charge. You'll have a handle with a trigger. Your powder coming in, it can either be through a, a hose if you're doing big applications, or you might have the one where the cup is actually screwed right to the bottom. You know, the, you have your scup, cup screwed right to the bottom here, full of powder. So you could have either or. You can have a, a hose feeding it, or you can have your cup screwed on there. You have a little clip for holding it when you're not using it, and it has a nozzle. Now, out of your, okay, here's your part to be coated. You have this hanging up, and it's connected to your ground right there. That's the important part to understand the ground. And what you have, when you pull the trigger, if you hold your button down, pull your trigger, what you have here is you're putting a cloud out, a cloud of powder. And that powder is mixed up with, with several different things. First, the blue particles. These blue particles, these are all the charged particles of powder that will be in the air. So it's going to be full of charged powder, the powder coating powder that you want to adhere to your part. It's also full of free ions. And free ions are what make the electrostatic process work. So this is what you basically have in the air if you could see it. Break it down into the microstructure. That's what it would look like in the air. So the question becomes this. From the science perspective, and some physics involved here, a little math, why is this cloud of powder attracted and why does it stick to a part that's hooked up to a ground? Why does that happen? Let's go through the math. So here's the tough part. Here's the math part. Here's the physics part. Whatever you want to call it. This is how the elect electrostatic potential energy works. And we talk about potential energy because when you pull a trigger on your powder coating gun, the powder goes across your high energy rod or plastic, whatever is inside your gun, it becomes charged with the ions. There's, electrical, there's an electrostatic potential between the powder and the part which is hooked to a ground. That electrostatic potential can be represented like this. The electrostatic potential energy, the U sub E, it, it's, a, it's a one point charge. One point charge Q because we just charged it with the ions negatively. I'll draw a quick picture of that, make it simpler, but I'm just going to show you the math, how this really works. So we have the, the single point charge, and it's in the presence of, uh, presence of an electric field. 
use of the electrical static potential energy. Potential, it's in the presence of electric field, and it's defined as the negative work, negative work it takes to get the electrostatic force to get to get to bring it from the reference position in the air, the powder is floating around in the air, and the electrostatic force or potential energy to bring it from in the air to its final resting place on our or on the part. Okay? That's the way that works. Where in this equation where E, E is the electric electrostatic field and the ds is the displacement vector the displacement vector curve that it takes to get from the reference position right here to its final position of r okay and it can be represented like this if you want an easier definition the the u sub e of a one point charge at at position q uh, I'm sorry, in the, in the point charge Q at position R in the presence of electro potential field is defined as the product of the charge product of the charge of the electrical potential. That's what that means. I know what you're saying. You're saying, holy crap, what the hell did he just say? So let me draw a picture real quick. You pull, your, you pull the trigger on your gun and the air is filled with powder like this. The air is filled with powder and you see that powder in the air floating. And you have your part. Right here. Here's your part. Hooked to the ground just like that. Hanging on something. Your part. Right now it's just powder. There is no electrical potential because it's powder in the air. There's no electrostatic potential energy. When you pull a trigger and the powder passes across the high energy field in your gun, these ions are added. And the ions that are added in here, like that, create potential energy because if I were to draw, and, and I'll, I'll make this, here's your basic atom with a nucleus, and you have, let me try and draw this so it, it looks like a Jimmy Neutron kind of thing, and another one going around this way, okay? You have your atom, and around your atom, your atom is full of, each one of these layers has electrons on it. Around the field, electrical field. So you have your atom powder, and in this case you'll have a molecule of resin, polyester, whatever it is, but they'll have this atom of powder. And it's in the air. When you pull the trigger and you do that, these ions are, are in the presence of electricity. You'll end up adding on the outside ring of this an extra electron. When you add the extra electron, this powder becomes negatively, it has a negative electrostatic potential, the U sub E. It becomes negative because it has an le extra electron. This powder wants to get rid of the ions or the electro extra electron in the atom of the molecules of the powder in the air. The only way it's going to do that is since this is a negative potential, this has a negative potential, it's going to be drawn and wants to give away that electron. It's statically charged. It's in the air. It has an extra electron. I want to get rid of it. So there's an electro, le, le, electromagnetic, electrostatic field in the air because now you have all the static around here. And that static is equivalent to when you rub a balloon and bring it close to your hair, you can see your hair start to come out. That's because you added electrons to the balloon, you're bringing it close to your hair, your hair is starting to, wants to take away those electrons so they're drawn together. And just like that, the powder is going to start to drift through the air and it's going to stick to the part. And once it sticks to the part, the extra electron goes into your part and the powder is left over and it sticks to the part. That is how powder coating works. You have a, 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 a mist, a cloud of powder. The, electro, the, the powder is, has ions in it. The ions are giving extra electrons to the atoms and the molecules of the powder in the air. The powder wants to get rid of that electron, so it flows through the air in the presence of a magnetic field or electrostatic field, and it gets to the part, and it wants to get rid of that electron. That's why it sticks to the part. Now, that everybody's completely bored and said, holy shit, I forgot all about differential equations and all this crap when I left college. That's how it works, but let's go, let's go code apart and you can see it in action. Okay, here's where you get to see the math and physics in action. 
So I'm going to go through the formula real quick and show you how this works. By the way, I use the powder, the Eastwood a hot coat powder coating, a powder coating gun. I've used this for a long time, and this thing has lasted a long time. It does a great job. I mean, you don't need to spend a fortune on a gun unless you're going to have production powder coating. So anyway, what I'm going to do is I have powder. The powder goes on the bottom here. I'm just leaving it off so it's easy to explain. I'm going to create an electrostatic potential energy, U sub B in the formula, of a point charge the point charge, remember I talked about the point charge? The point charge Q, by taking this ground clip and hooking it up to the part. By doing that, I'm creating a point charge Q at position R, the final resting place in the presence of an electro, uh, electric field, E, capital E. Okay, so I have an electric field. I have my transformer that takes my current, turns it into high voltage, it comes up this wire, it comes into this metal wire that goes through this hot coat gun. Inside the hot coat gun are these plastic tubes, and these plastic tubes are what create the ions, or add the electron to the, to the atom of the uh, powder in the powder coat, the gun in the air. So what I'm going to do is to create this electrostatic potential. There's a diffuser that goes on the end, that's just to diffuse the powder. So again, I'm going to create an electrostatic field, E sub U, the electrostatic potential energy, the electric field E, and it's going to be the negative work, the negative work, it's done by the electrostatic force to bring the charged particles from the reference point out in space to its reference position, or for, to the final position R and the formula. So from reference to final resting R, the point charge, and again, the um, point charge Q, uh, the point charge Q at position R in the presence of an electric potential, the potential between the powder and the part, it's the product of the charge that I put here and the electric potential between that charge and the part, okay? So let me zoom this back and I'll start the, the process. I'll show you what it looks like without when, it's, when you have powder not in the presence of an electro, electrostatic force or not in the presence of electrostatic potential energy. And then when you turn the power on, you can see the electric potential energy take over and suck the powder right into the part. Okay, now I have my powder in the gun. I'm using a Eastwood's color. It's called cast aluminum. And I, and I hope you'll be able to see this. Uh, I think you will. So right now, there's no potential energy. There's no electric potential between this powder and the part. And if I pull this trigger like that, all you see is powder in the air, right? Because there's no electrical potential. What I have to do, according to the formula, is create a point charge in the part. Point charge Q, R, final resting place. I'm going to pull a trigger on my hot coat gun, and then what it does is it gets current through here, it creates high current inside this uh, tube right here to charge the powder. And if you don't think it's a high charge, I'll, I'll go like this with a little powder and, and you can watch. I'll turn, pull it here and you'll hear a spark. See that spark? There's a lot of high current there, a lot of high voltage inside here created by this transformer. So now I know I pull this, I'm pulling this, I'm charging the part, I'm creating my point charge at Q. As the powder gets sucked up through the gun here, it gets sucked up through the gun, it's going to go across those tubes and through this, in the presence of an electrical field, it's become charged with extra electrons and it's going to be drawn to the part via the electric potential or the electrostatic potential energy. Now watch. Now watch what happens now that it's charged, now the powder will get charged. Now, you see how it sort of goes towards the part? Instead of just flying off in the air, see how it's sucking right to the part? You can see it start, now put a little bit more. It, it's, it's drawn right to the part. Because right in here we have in this mist of powder, I have, it's even attracting to my finger because now I'm statically charged. These particles of powder now have ions in there that have electro extra electrons. They want to get rid of those electrons, so it's being drawn towards the part to get rid of those electrons because I created point charge Q with the ground on the part. So I finished powder coating the rest of the surface, put it in the oven, baked it for 375 at 375, Float out 20 minutes after flow out, let it cool down, and this is what it looks like. The, the cast aluminum color you can see is a little different than the color I put on here, the OEM wheel silver. I just like this color a little bit more, but this is what the customer wanted, so it's just a cast aluminum color. That is how powder coating works. 
That is why it works. That's the science behind powder coating. And uh, if you have any questions about powder coating, I'd be glad to answer them if I can. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, I really love explaining it to you. And again, if you have any questions, let me know. I answer them as quick as I possibly can. I appreciate your patience when you do ask questions because it takes me a while to get back to them. I have a lot of emails and from Facebook questions and then uh, feedback from the YouTube videos. And I got to try and answer them all. And it takes me a while, but I'll get to it. I promise I will get to it. Thank you for all your emails. And as usual, I appreciate you stopping by Pizza Garage.